Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by BlackRifleCoffee.com. Well, well, well. Oh, hi. Here we go. Hi. Guys, how's it going? Oh, God. man. Well, that soft, friendly sound. It's way one. too friendly for what, you know, he really oh. is. You know what he, you know what I mean? Like, I think it's always the super friendly guys you have to worry about. It's like, uh, <laughs> with, well, with yeah. you know, the, the, the body counts, your wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> think about growing all that. <laughs> have you? I, think, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like the pad thing we talked about yesterday. Right. Waking up and hitting that thing. I think I've yeah. outgrown You've some outgrown of that it? stuff. I think so. I've moved is it, on. Is Transitioned. It just, Transitioned. Is it just that you have less testosterone in your body it's possible. now? Like it's you're possible. Just, your testosterone. <laughs> Declining, so you're not punching a fucking mat anymore. <laughs> it, that might be instantly. It. I've heard recently if you eat a lot of soy, it it it, it it's uh, high in estrogen, Ooh. so it can it can it can have that. effects. It can have very womanly. I think effects. it's just poison, just in soy general. Soy is yeah, poison. Soy is yeah. So who do we got here on Drinking Bros today? We have uh, Jack Carr, Terminal List author, former Navy SEAL. <sighs> Officer and enlisted. Ooh, both. Thank Mustang. You, thank you. Oh, got the Mustang. Fuck. How many years? Twenty in a wake up. Twenty in a wake up. That's legit, oh. man. Well, let's talk about this first. I would like mm -hmm. to hear your opinion. I Please. I think that we are completely outdated and outgrown our the whole officer enlisted thing. Like, why haven't we updated to a progressive structure? Like, uh, specifically Germany. I think it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak in general terms. I believe they have six enlisted ranks, and then you move into the officer corps. If you want to stay enlisted, you can and become a first sergeant and sergeant major, or you become a lieutenant, captain, and then you move. So that means at every point in their military, their captains, their majors, their colonels, mm -hmm. they have all enlisted. started. They all, and now my, my point is, is I look at the people when in 2002, when we took the branch, the, the, my friends in Washington state, that all went to Washington state university, fucked off their parents' money for four years, barely made it to class, barely passed, were drunk for four years. They Meanwhile, should have gone, gone for five that four that at that four year point, I'd already been on a combat deployment. I'd already been promoted into a junior NCO leadership position. You know, it was like, okay, let's compare those two people. Now, why are we still in this day and age saying this one gets to be in charge? Right, right. No, there's definitely something to that. And the officer enlisted structure in general is definitely antiquated. There's no doubt about it. Um, so go back and forth a little bit on that. I think there are great officers that come from the enlisted ranks, and there are very bad officers that Correct. come from the enlisted ranks, yep. just like there are great officers that come from the academies and mm -hmm. terrible ones. Um, so, uh, But I do think there's something to having everybody start in the mailroom and work their way up, which is why I started like that because I wanted to establish a reputation. I wanted to be a sniper, and I knew that officers typically weren't snipers. And uh, well, they were snipers. With that just happened towards their sniper targets. Yeah, they were like <laughs> that fucking dude is a sniper. Boom. But it's just Chewing like if me we up. Look, we look <laughs> at, at at you know the the seventeen hundreds when we started this was all because of who can read and who can't generally. Like uh, who can write, who could, who's able to record what was going down, you know, is educated towards the farm people and stuff like that. So it's like, how, why has this lasted so long? Right. It's one of those things like gigantic bureaucracy, like everything else in the right. military. <laughs> it's hard, hard to change. A protected. Exactly. Protected yeah. society. You know, I'm sure there's something. What do you think? Uh, do you like something it? Something to that. Do you think we're outdated? Uh, I think that we've, I think that we have, uh, we've, we've, we've passed that differentiating point i think there's something to be said about having a degree i think that there's a certain amount of um uh i guess when i say check the block it's not just a check in the block you have to kind of suck it up through four or five sometimes six or seven depending on what kind of program you're on <laughs> they're called doctors um yeah they're not <laughs> sometimes they're called bachelor's degrees <laughs> but i think uh, from my perspective, I think leadership is one of those abstract. Um, it's a it's a it's an abstract quality that not everybody has. So regardless, so you don't of, believe it's a learned skill. Uh, I think that you can cultivate it. I think that you can enhance it. But I think uh, a lot of people, and especially good leaders, it's a uh, it's a it, it's not only an environmental factor as far as how they were raised. It's directly how they were raised and who they are as individuals that ultimately it's enhanced through 
training and mentorship, uh, just like management. So management is something that not all leaders have, right? So you can be a very charismatic leader and be someone incompetent at managing large scale projects. Um, I think where your your people like you, but you're not really getting the results. Well, you can have like uh, that's why there's operations guys, right? And so when you got a very charismatic leader in in a in a very detail oriented operations guys, you've got a yin and yang to that mechanism. And when you really have two people that work really well together, uh, like a commander and a first sergeant or a commander XO, this great relationship is is emphasized by a person that has and can implement strategic vision and mobilize people around a, an, an idea and a mission, uh, orient and pursue this uh, uh, objective as far as being able to, to get your men in the right place, right time, right uniform, that's ops, right? So uh, morale, um, emphasizing morale and how important group psychology is into accomplishing a, a, a vision. Team and building. Then, and then the actual brass tacks of motivating, and I shouldn't say motivating, but organizing. You know, a, a good operations guy uh, organizes the organization. Right, that's not necessarily the job of a leader. A leader is 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 a, is a different individual, especially in larger teams, larger teams and companies. Well, what going back you, to what you what, what Jared you said, is it is that guy uh, a good leader because he had four years of, of drinking in college, or is it something he has had more opportunities but at, along the way, like a right. few more than the person coming out of high school? Uh, so for me, I looked at it just as a continuation mm -hmm. of sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Then there was high school. Then there was college. Then there was the military. That's just how I looked at it. Um, was college any more beneficial than, than high school? It was just more time for me to mm -hmm. prepare, more time for me to train, more time for me to get ready for what I knew I was going to do. Uh, and not everybody looks at it like that way, but it's just more time on the planet mm -hmm. there than the 18-year-old has. But that 18-year-old that comes out and jumps right in the military and jumps right onto a track that takes him to Iraq or Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and he's under working under good leaders, both officer and enlisted, then that life experience may be different from but the guy that comes in the military and goes to, the, let's just say, uh, I don't know, doesn't deploy stays right. here as horrible leaders is doing something administrative or in supply, whatever, right. very important, of course, but they're not out there getting good battlefield leadership and learning how to do it and making it their own as they move forward. Mm -hmm. But looking at the system now, like the, you kind of sparked a new point is like it, thinking, thinking back on that, it's like, what if we, we've come up with this, you know, one through, through 12th grade and then four years of college, you know, what if we stopped at 16 and you had to get you had to get a trades job for four or five years before you could even apply for college so you're not even going to college until you're 24 25 26 where you're going to take it more seriously oh, and yeah. when it's when you're riding on it i mean that's what i'm thinking on all my experiences back back then i wish i could have started when i was 30. i would have rather been in the military starting at 30 and on just because I think it would have been so much more effective. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. You definitely get more out of the college experience, I think, if you're just starting it later, if you have yeah. some life experience, if you have a little time to take a breath between high school and college, apply a trade, learn a trade, travel, whatever it is, learn right. a language, learn it. Go you know, to so culture. you're not you're not in right. this because you see these. It's not just high school these, without parents. These sects and these pockets of people around the country that have never mm. left Sex. their security their security walls. So there's never a change in thinking, and that's kind of like. What, one of the things, uh, anytime I, I, I get around some hyper left person, the first question I ever ask, have you ever been outside the country? And they always say no. Really? And it's like, or they've, or they've <laughs> been out of the country and it's like, yeah, I went to, to Canada. I went, oh, I didn't, you know, I went to London or, um, <laughs> it's like, no, but seriously, that's, that's America with an accent. That's like going to Alabama. Um, <clears throat> No, I think that it's, I, I've thought a lot about this because, you know, selection is an interesting process, right? Where you go through, you know, weeks and months, years of, of cultivating a skill and leadership is a skill. It's, it's, I think that you can cultivate it. I think that you can emphasize a specific trait, just like, um, you know, a comms guy or a, uh, you know, a medic. So if you're selecting for that criteria based on performance early, and I think we've all seen it where a good leader can quite literally take the performance of a team of people from the last to the first. Oh, yeah. Now, 
finding what that is is super difficult, right? So what is it that defines the characteristics of a good leader and how do you measure those? How well, that's do why you they're measure still writing that? books about it. Well, yeah. well also to too, do you out, agree uh, that a good leader, despite the training and the cultivation, requires a specific set of personality traits? And if you're outside of some of those, you're never, you're never going to get it. Well, it depends on the results, right? So you, I think you have to you have to grade or, or select the appropriate data points based on what you're trying to accomplish with that uh, or trying to seek. So, you know, if for instance, if you're a, a comms guy, I, I know that when we were talking about the the selection and aptitude tests, if you were going into the medical or communication, you had to score higher within a certain. Uh, within certain aspects of, of even your, your ASVAP. And then a secondary selection was based on math. You had to have some type of um, gift or you had to test out it at least, I think it was like a 12th grade math criteria. So for for whatever reason, there wasn't a lot of fucking math going on in Camo, you know, cutting. Did you do a lot at Camo? I did. You? So I, yeah. was, uh, I was in my MOS or A school before BUDS when you have to used to have to have one of those right. was Intel school. So I went to 16 weeks of Intel school before I showed up at BUDS because they fine. thought you were going to fail right. out. That's were you a the sniper fleet. in so 2005? I was. Were you in Mosul? I was. In, wait, hold on, stop. I was in 2004 in Mosul. In 2005, I was in Mosul as well. Yeah. Wow, look at that. Do you remember hanging out with the tech peas? Oh my <laughs> is this when we're going after that? that there was that sniper. That yeah, there was the, the there head. was the sniper yeah. that up in the Mosul with the striker I, brigade. Yes, yeah. you you sat in my striker what? and we were talking about Cass. <laughs> what? Seriously? I do remember this. Yes, now. you That's pulled the crazy. giant fucking Marine Corps book open. Dude, I don't remember that about a Marine Corps. But anyway, I remember like, going up. Well, there. it was a it was a striker brigade. Yes, and we you were, were with the the, the four one uh, buffaloes and the and the one seventy second striker brigade, and we kept dropping you guys off in the height in the hides and. Because they kept taking our, they, they, they had just shots. taken one of our guys out. Yeah. Uh, the round went between us and hit him. Uh, and then that, that's when uh, you guys came out to come try and find it. That's it. And we were, were, you were putting no in the way. fake cam cameras. That's it, the fake camera. Yeah. I don't know if we're allowed to talk about that. Though. I think the lawyers, that's why I was like, the lawyers we were put putting an end in that. the... Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think the, the Jags put an end to that pretty quick as soon as they found out what we were doing. But uh, the yeah, there was some, uh, some Iraqi sniper, maybe it was a foreign fighter, I forget, that was that they thought was shooting people in the head that escaped, escaped from Abu Ghraib maybe, yeah. and uh, and was up there. All of a sudden, the sniper escapes, and then the headshots start happening in Missoula, I think. Yeah, you took um, us shooting, though down one day like me and the two other tack piece nice. and we went because you, you guys had you guys had your uh you guys had a very good chow hall yes oh my god the pasta bar and everything that was crazy because <laughs> oh i'm coming from armadi this is this is like and so <laughs> perfect to any military story you have millions of people listening and the only thing they want to hear about is fucking killing people and, but the two military guys at the table are like dude you remember that fucking chow hall? <laughs> that was a fucking awesome chow hall. <laughs> that was crazy. Yeah. It was so different from Azul. I'm sorry, from Ramadi because I was yeah. coming from Ramadi. Because you're coming from Shark Base, Ramadi, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they brought over the, you know, whatever those plastic tubs were called, whatever that is. And uh, you'd go down the line. It was all cold. Already. Mermites. Yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. That's it. The yeah. mermites. Totally forgot about that. Yeah. And then we go to Missoula and we're on this base up there. And yeah. Man, that was Shanghai. Diamondback. Yeah, you li that's you guys it. lived down in Diamondback yeah. and yep. I was up yeah. in Merez. Okay. And then, yeah. Yeah. That's right, Merez. Dude, and I was in Merez. In time. Oh, eight, oh, nine. That's crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. Yeah, we were only up there for maybe a month, three weeks. Well, we like that. every time, yeah, every time we took you guys in, you went with my element because That's we awesome. had the we had the the birds. Nice, <laughs> nice. Yeah, it was a crazy one. That uh, that camera op was a was a crazy one. Um, well, what was yeah. fun about that time frame is you had a constant air patrol over Mosul. So 24 yeah. hours a day, there were two F-14s just doing circles with loaded to the tits, just ready. So it didn't matter what you were doing. It was just like, huh, cast on call, hey. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I brought up uh, like a couple of cast guys. We're all, because we're all, uh, I was fire enlisted sniper, and then I had a couple of snipers with me, a comm guy with me. Um, and I think somebody else, but anyway, we had like four or five of us that came up to do yeah, that stuff. It was a small element. Cool. You guys were only there for what? Six weeks, something like that. Something yeah. I made to get back to Ramadi. That stuff was heating up down <laughs> what there. What a fucking small I knew, world. I knew crazy. I could tell That's like crazy. from yesterday, I was like, wait a minute. The beard was fooling me. I only got a beard at that point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe I did. No, I, I had a beard in Ramadi and I had to shave it to go yeah, to Missoula. Yeah, yeah, you were, you were clean shaven down yeah. there. You had to shave it to go to Missoul. <laughs> you had to work army, you know. You had to get impression. Yeah. You had to put the uniform on and the. You guys brought a couple Iraqi SF guys. That's right. We had a whole yeah. uh, team out there. Yeah, because we would the eat 
we ate a few a few nights together yeah no that was that was good and uh you have setting those you got the lovis guys going out yeah, there doing yeah. their thing and yeah that was that was wild oh i actually have something really funny that we'll talk after the show <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah it's, that you would jail. that you would recognize <laughs> awesome <laughs> like diamondback Merez was was one of the best and one of the worst experiences in mosul the the range though the open yeah, I had, range. I had a great, I had on, a great range. Up yeah, there. and yeah. nobody, nobody would go. Like, did I yeah. tell you about this? Like, the the strikers had an area that was as big as half of this room with ammo cans full of loose five five six, just ro roped off. Like, and if you needed five yeah. five six, you would just go grab it for your truck. Well, there was we would be done with patrols before the sun went down, and there was nothing to fucking do. So I would go grab a case of that and drive up to that range and be the only one there for hours just nice. shooting and i went into the tank graveyard and found a bunch of uh of of like hatches so yeah. i set up a bunch of hatches nice so i had steel, steel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah. that's when i met the oda awesome. team they came up in a rsx uh and and got out and they were like looking at me like what because they didn't understand i was wearing like half acus and a different plate care They're like what yeah, are you i was like yeah. i'm tack p they're like oh, oh shit you're man. coming with us <laughs> awesome yeah awesome that is crazy what a small cool. world that's super that, that, crazy. that is like that's crazy <laughs> that's crazy <laughs> man that's like deductive yeah, for reasoning one, for one four to six week time frame in 2005 yeah that we crossed paths and yeah. that's insane I know. <laughs> insane and that kiss Cheers. you shared the bold yeah was so well, special, it, it was, was i was sitting with your comment <laughs> we're gonna talk about <laughs> i did i, I it's a different sat, podcast <laughs> i sat with different your promo branding. guy for a while because he was showing me the piss five yeah. and i'd never seen a okay. piss five yeah and, yeah, and then and then we went shooting with you guys for a day and then dropped you guys off and the piss uh, five was a fucking nice. horrible system yeah well i, it, it, I, I don't know why i don't know why the seal teams carried them i know i, I don't know why, why don't you just buy a 117 fucking, yeah that's, <laughs> well, it's like i don't know why time we had like the 117 charlie and then yeah. delta and then it didn't really get good fox. until the golf and fox yeah, yeah. well right. yeah your fox was that was the money right. back then yeah. yeah i don't know what they have now i just remember like constantly being frustrated with satcoms off the piss five because you had like 30 different fucking menus that you had to work through in order to get this and you'd have like a <laughs> cheat sheet it's not for everybody it, it's it's not it's it's truly not but i remember like anytime you could get satcom with a piss five you're a fucking rock star well you know you could finger fuck a fox in under 30 seconds by just plugging in an uplink yeah. and downlink difference in the uhf that was <laughs> like, a good one like and then well, pinging it real quick they, and then you're like all right we're good but it wasn't even that it was it it, it, it to all those listeners that we just lost they're like oh, we don't understand <laughs> what you're talking about like you had this brick called the uh, cyz 10 it was like this you remember the crazy 10 i do yeah. yeah and it was like the worst fucking thing on the planet to navigate like, and it was not ANC. horrible it was not intuitive was whatsoever not an and you're trying to make comms between two things that are not intuitive so you're trying to load your radio with the right crypto and put in the right settings and you know, if you but, breathe but fucking fair, left it it doesn't work satcom was far far more simple than trying to take a crazy 10 and a 119 and talk singars oh, you had to singers. click the no. hand mic the fucking, 10 that, times like to that. change cop. your hop set number the fucking free cop <laughs> <laughs> like, we just lost yeah. a million listeners. Like, <laughs> literally, but interestingly enough, I've I given enough combo courses to understand that we need to stop talking about combo yeah. so because everyone is asleep. Shit. But I will say that when I went over to work with uh, the the former group that you used to work yeah. for, uh, which was on that same deployment just into 2006, uh, a lot of cell phone usage. So that was tons, much easier. Tons of, that's, that's what I'm saying. So when I went over there, everybody's <laughs> talking on cell phones. So it was so perfect. Like texting. It was great. Just like, hey, pick me up here. Here's yeah. the grid. Text. Yeah. It's like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> this is what you guys are doing? Exactly. Yeah, it's way easier than Loved it. That's, yeah. why, that's why I had such a good experience, perhaps. I know. Well, being yeah. the master tacticians of both of you, let's, uh, what are your thoughts on Antifa? Ooh. Wow. <laughs> You know this from a from a tactical point of view. From a tactical <laughs> point of view, I think that one. I think that it's just hilarious that the 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 socialist or the democratic socialist movements and are are, are comprised an anti fascist <laughs> in any claim whatsoever. So for the last several decades, they've been trying to disarm the civilian population. Yeah, the the democratic socialists have basically been taking away or trying to lobby to take away our second amendment rights but now all of a sudden they want the second amendment rights because they're trying to have some type of mounted insurgency against the government it's like <laughs> well 
make up your fucking mind. Like one day it would be great if you guys just made up your mind and said, well, am I pro 2A? No, I'll tell you what it is. They're pro 2A if the guns are in the hands of a socialist. Right. So they're 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 pro First Amendment yeah, yeah, when they're aren't talking. We, aren't we kind they're of pro Second Amendment when they're holding the way. gun? Yeah. It's just like every socialist from the from from the development of of any Marxist thought thereafter. It's we're pro whatever we believe and anti whatever every, everybody else believes. So really, they should just be called anti my idea. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, what they need. But I mean, one thing that we do have going for us or our side is, you know, their side attracts like the most weak, malnourished. <laughs> like they're all, you know, I love the training, the training videos, heavy that they put vegan out there. Yeah. diet. Yeah. Like, like the <laughs> ISIS <laughs> training videos make those guys look <laughs> so funny. like so like, great. Like the, the ISIS training videos, the, those guys look like CAG compared to the Antifa <laughs> 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 yeah, training right. videos. I just think it's funny I have that not a bunch of dudes that have never handled anything weapons <laughs> or even gone through like a sixth grade karate kata yeah. are trying to like <laughs> mount an insurgency with uh, the, the equivalent of like a baseball catcher's uniform <laughs> in, a, in a single speed bicycle that they have to borrow from their cousin. They're getting a late start. Yeah. You yeah. know, it might catch up. What but, do you think? I mean, you're an, you're an Intel guy. What do you think about this? Well, I saw at the uh, former uh, Intel guy at the uh, inauguration. <laughs> I got fig. to see them running around with uh, the black masks on. Oh shit! You were at the inauguration. You were at the inauguration. Yeah, I got to uh, got to see them at work, and uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of them. That's for sure. They masked in the in a city, and they really? caused destruction and damage, and wow. uh, so they can just by they don't even have to succeed. Really, right. it can be a strategy of failure. Just mm-hmm. to continue, um, hurt the economy, disrupt right. disrupt commerce, disrupt people that are trying to get to and from work and mm-hmm. do their jobs and raise their families. Um, so, I mean, they can do that for as long as the populace, the productive population, will put up with it. Right. I, uh, yeah, I think. So, who do you think they're funded by? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there, I would, I would venture to guess that there are some professionals out there that are right. getting some. I would guess getting mm-hmm. some money from some people that have disposable income. Right. Should, like because there, there's the there's the whole conspiracy theory and or theory I should say that that George Soros he funds a huge percentage of these uh, socialist movements or the Antifa movement. Would you, would you would you expand on that? Is there any is there any direct link? Do you think between well, well, his organizations and these? I will say that I have not studied it oh, in, okay. in depth um, yeah. or really at all, mm-hmm. but. Uh, I would venture a guess that once you see people gathering and you see a movement that there is probably money to be made mm-hmm. on a few different fronts there right. and that money would come in from somebody that uh, that has that kind of money to spend and that sort of an ideology. So right. I would, uh, it would not be beyond the realm of possibility to have someone like that or multiple people like that funding this uh I won't even say insurgency because that's uh, that's is, yeah it's disrespectful to actually yeah. insurgency. Disres- yeah. 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 Disrespectful, disrespectful to, to actual insurgency. insurgency. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think what they need, I think what they need is they need, they need Uncle Sam to just kind of bend him over and give him a fucking spanking. I saw a post. <laughs> that, uh, I, saw, I saw a post that might be coming out about this. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah I think that's uh, what they need. They need Uncle need Sam to just kind of like take him over the knee and fucking their parents. tear in their hide. Yeah, maybe I, their parents. I think that's what it is. I, I I don't know. I think we should stop putting up with it. Like anybody that shows up to any protest wearing any sort of padding or a mask, just hit them over the head with a club and zip them up right there and throw them in the back of a truck. Like, that's it. If you come to a protest with padding on, I, you have intent to yeah, no, start some shit. I'm no, I'm no lawyer, but uh, I think I said, I think you're onto something. I think that's great. If we start something. doing that, guess what? It starts going away. I don't know. I, because I think if you, if you put yourself in the, in, the, in the situation where you could be, or as the government could be, and or in the community municipality from whatever law enforcement entity is positioned as a fascist or some type of police state. Uh, I think you're, you're setting yourself up for a, a PR nightmare to oh, some yeah. degree. Well, that's what so, the insurgents were so good at uh, yeah. overseas. I mean, they, 
much like as you guys know, their uh, their marketing and their ability to adapt and mm -hmm. figure out what their end state was before the mission, right. uh, and then plan backwards from the end state that they wanted for the, that political effect, for that marketing effect, yeah. for recruitment or whatever whatever their end state was. Mm -hmm. Whereas we would say, okay, we want to go grab this guy off the street, whether he's a bomb maker, a jaywalker, whatever, um, and off we go. And then we finish the mission, and then hey, PAO, uh, let's do this and talk about this is what happened on the mission by that point the enemy's already moved on mm -hmm. and so is everybody else and we've missed the opportunity and we didn't even start with the end state in mind uh, whereas the enemy does so um, the Antifa's uh, maybe they're doing that I would imagine they are because I mean information operations have been around for a long time and it really doesn't take a lot to kind of read a couple books and figure out exactly what you can do in order to manipulate information and I think when you have a news outlet or several news outlets that are ultimately favorable to your side, it's fairly easy to, to, to spin the, the, the correct narrative, right? Um, and when I say correct, it's whatever narrative you're trying to, to, to push out there. I think these guys, I think it's absolutely absurd to label the, uh, the current administration as a fascist administration. I don't think there's any, there's any correlating evidence and or, direct representation of fascism in any way, shape or form as far as being able to properly define it. So f for me, I'm, I'm just asking for one, I've one never, thing, just, I've just give me a thing. I've never says, even seen this represents fascism. Y yeah. I've never even seen any one of these guys be interviewed and produce a reason why. Like they don't, they don't know why they don't like the administration. No. They don't have to, but because they don't have to, they just right? play. I mean, that's it. They, they play off of complete fallacies. I've, I've heard somebody say, he puts children in cages. No, he what? doesn't. <laughs> well, regardless, I mean, for, for a certain demographic, it's, it's exciting, it's new, right. and it's, uh, it's, it's, a greater, it's a sense of purpose that's something greater than themselves. Mm -hmm. It's a lot like the military in that respect. So it's, uh, it's a, a community, it's, it's a club, it's, right. uh, it's uh, something for these people to, to, to rally behind, even though it, it, the, the craziest part is that what they think they are fighting for is exactly what they are taking away. That's right. freedom. Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, you know, it, when, when th and if they get a little older, perhaps right. they'll realize, realize that and move on and maybe get jobs and be productive. This stuff in Portland, yeah. like, like, in so Pol is in, in Poland, Port Portland, what's going on in Portland uh, the, right now? They're going hard. Like they keep blocking traffic. They the keep old guy out of the, out of his car the other day. Yeah. And it was just, oh yeah. man, it was what? so horrible to yeah, see so, that. So they are just taking it upon themselves to block certain roads and tell people to go a different way but some of the people aren't having it they're like no i'm just gonna drive like again we need to address this that, if that you're be, in the road <laughs> trying to do something a, like this you need to just you're allowed to run them over you should absolutely be allowed to run them over i would if if they pass that law i would mount a freaking snow plow on the front of an f-150 and i would roll into him about 70 miles an hour <laughs> there's a lot of changes in the law lately that might be allowed i'm not sure that's <laughs> Like that, you got to watch the that videos. Just, that just seems to me like like you've you've let people, you've conditioned people to think that it's okay to do that, and I think that that's there's there's multiple ways that you can you can, you know, you can prevent that from happening. Most of the time, that would come from you know somebody trying to take you out of your vehicle would be putting a muzzle in their face. Mm -hmm. That would probably end that entire that entire interaction. Was probably just end that conversation. Yeah. Like this is what freedom looks like, which is you don't have the freedom to take me out of my car and I have the freedom to carry a gun. So Fucking congratulations, you've won the lottery today, friend. You get domed. Yeah, <laughs> ding dong. <laughs> hey, I think that's, uh, that's such an interesting aspect of, of America where, when I've seen it, I mean, we've all seen it in these videos where people just, I watched uh, one video of a guy in Boise take a, a full like haymaker swing at an older guy that was holding a Trump sign at a rally, like a full on like haymaker. The guy standing next to the dude that was was getting going to get punched, just reached out and grabbed the fist before it hit his face and just pushed it back and then smiled at the kid. <laughs> and I was like, gosh, man, these kids, dude. And I, I'm not trying to put it as far as like a generational thing because there's plenty of people that are like 50 and 60 years old. It's just... Well, yeah, the sign ripping so... thing, though, you have a point here. They think that they can grab signs out of people's hands if they don't like there's them. There's a, there's, a, there's a really big double standard there. I think there's a double standard between 
progressives and conservatives. I think that that you've got a significant portion of the progressive population that thinks it's it's okay, even though they're 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 throwing out pacifist belief systems, but it's only in relationship to you can't cause harm to them, right? It's like, well, you can't take a swing at me because, you know, I'm a progressive, but I can swing at you. And take your sign. Yeah, well, the intolerance that's so, uh, that's so disappointing. That's why, right. why, why, why are, From that side. And, uh, it be, and it, it's, it's you know, one of those... Uh, one of those things that eventually they're going to go after the wrong the wrong person um, and Oof. they're being encouraged by yeah. by their leadership both within the movement and by political right. leaders to go out there and harass people that have a different point of view harass them with their families harass them in places that are completely inappropriate and eventually they're going to do that to someone that is not going to take it and it's not going to end well um, and then right. there are those of us that don't do that sort of thing right. that, uh, that know what's appropriate what's not appreciate this country appreciate our freedoms know how much opportunity we have here um but we also have to start taking uh, some precautions because that that other side will find your home. Yeah, they will come. They will post. They will pick it. They will do mm -hmm. things like that to uh, to get a video clip to try to to try to antagonize you. So there are certain things that, uh, especially people that have platforms, should be thinking about. So mm -hmm. putting their phone, their 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 uh, utilities and their homes uh, in LLCs or in trusts mm -hmm. that have names that are not associated with them or their companies, um, things like that. Just make it a little bit harder for somebody right. to track you down or make somebody else a more attractive target. Um, so there's, there's a security aspect to this as well. Mm -hmm. No, I couldn't agree more. And I think that that's, you touched on some really important points, which is the, uh, the political influence and or leadership and those people promoting that it, it's, it's socially acceptable in order to cause harm and or dysfunction to, uh, I think the Kavanaugh, I think the Kavanaugh hearings, I think are a direct representation. They, they, they ruined a man's life essentially, over uh, an accusation. And there was no due process. There was the automatic assumption that he was guilty because he was male. Like, literally, and because he's a white male, he's villainized, he's assumed that he's guilty, there's no due process. You had a, a large percentage of the, the leadership saying that it is acceptable to do this because he represents somebody that they want to condemn. I, I think it's, well, it's ethically it's inappropriate at minimum. A massive percentage of the side against him didn't even know their head from their ass when it came to the story. And that was that was something we, when I was watching the, the Crowder, the Crowder stuff is right. when he started questioning the girl about specific pieces of, of facts about the case, she had zero answers on any of no. them so but was but her opinion was based on the polar opposite that existed of real fact so we have a, we have a system based on the presumption of innocence so she right. was saying process. he she brought four corroborated witnesses to the two together and they all had the same story he goes no that's it's absolutely the, the opposite of yeah. what happened yeah. so it's like this this age of misinformation is fucking working because well, people, people are basing, people don't know how lucky we are to live in right. this country where we do no, have dear process. No, we are where spoiled. We, where we do have that presumption of innocence because they have. It's, we're not close enough to a time where we didn't have that, mm -hmm. or that it hasn't been taught coming up through the school systems. Uh, they haven't been to a country where there is not that presumption right. of innocence, where you see people strung up from bridges and that sort of thing, and then you have a, a dictatorship that can do essentially whatever they want. They can presume you guilty. They can um, they can focus the the, uh, the the efforts and the energy of the state on bringing you down, um, and they don't have that. They do not have that presumption of innocence, and that is something that we need to guard in this country because it really makes us who we are. In the, in the, the complete denial of the the fact that this man had gone through multiple different background checks by the the fbi throughout the course of his lifetime uh with the discount the, they discounted his entire record these were the things where i was like gosh you guys are really out to destroy one individual and i think it became very obvious and i listened to his his, his entire speech did you listen to it it's 45 yeah. minutes it was powerful. He, the condemnation of him specifically, and I guess, and you know, with a SNL uh, shedding light on it in a very negative way, where he's you know ranting or you know he was he was very he was he was very passionate about it. 
but I can't imagine as a, as a man that has, has spent his entire life in service and in literally service to the country for one person to make an accusation and a person that you never met to just come out of nowhere and say, woodwork, yeah. this happened. And then for an entire millions of people to, to condemn you as guilty before you've, before you've had a chance to prove that you are innocent. Like these are things that are just inherently, when I say wrong, like that well, is wrong. It's not even proving you're innocent. They, <laughs> the other side has to prove that you're yes. guilty. Yeah, That's... right. Yeah, <laughs> prove that you're guilty. Right. And well. and he's saying, just allow me the opportunity to prove that I did not do this, and look at the facts as far as look at what I'm look, listen to what I'm saying, and trust the fact that even the the, the bureau has done their job, and then multiple facts. It was somebody with a record like that too. What a thirty plus female. Oh my gosh! Come forward like, that said I've worked with him over the last twenty some odd years. Well, maybe it's a. Uh, you know, so, it's, it's a tactic being tested right. by by a side to see yeah. if it works, and they'll yeah. find out in midterms mm -hmm. if it they worked will. or not. Uh, right. We'll all find out. Right? We'll um, all find out. And if will that yeah. be a, will that be a tactic that we'll see more of in the future? And we won't know. Until, I, I uh, guarantee until November. We right. Well, which is interesting because your book you classify it as what do you classify it? It's a politically it's a political military thriller. Political military thriller. So you've spent some time kind of down the rabbit hole with international terrorism, uh, domestic politics. So you, yeah. you've, you've investigated a, some of these issues, I would imagine. So what do you dive into in the book? Yeah, so the conspiracy side, I, I thought, hey, what it makes a great thriller? Mm -hmm. And I've read a lot of this stuff growing up, and uh, my mom was a librarian, so I, 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 I read books. <laughs> I love that so much. Age. I think that's so <laughs> fucking cool. We're just surrounded by books, right. uh, which is how I found out, uh, did my research into the SEAL teams, and then I uh, naturally gravitated towards books and movies that had something to do with the military. Mm -hmm. So reading books like Brotherhood of the Rose, uh, Charm School, all the Tom Clancy's, the A.J. Quinnell's, J.C. Pollock's, like all these guys in the, in the 80s and uh, up into the 90s with... Um, uh, Stephen Hunter and then later Daniel Silva and then Brad Thor and Vince Flynn later on but um, there's an element to the thriller that has a conspiracy attached to it right. um, and people so I combined the conspiracy with the age-old theme of revenge and revenge without constraint and coupled those two together revenge for this great. book <laughs> so revenge, revenge is very is great it was a very therapeutic book to write because it uh, mm. although fiction I took all the emotions that I have felt at some point over the last 20 years in the military and took those emotions from certain events and applied them to the fictional narrative so mm -hmm. it reads like hey this guy's really experiencing this and uh, if people get that out of the book that's because I did experience those feelings those emotions at some point over the last 20 years in certain situations so right um, but uh, the conspiracy side of the house comes from the church hearings uh, Frank right. Church in the uh, the late 70s that uh, looked into some abuses of power by certain elements of the federal government and I was inspired by that to create a conspiracy where the government and certain elements of the financial and pharmaceutical industries are testing drugs on our nation's most elite soldiers right. and that goes a little haywire they need to cover up those experiments and hence we have the conspiracy unraveled by our protagonist, James Reese, who then comes back home and uses what worked against us in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, on home soil. So he becomes the insurgent that he'd been fighting for the last 16 <laughs> plus years at war and brings those tactics home and works his way up his list to the highest echelons of the U.S. government. So you spent the last couple of years thinking about this. Yeah. Right? Like several, several times. I would, I would imagine several times per day. Hours of your life basically has been spent thinking about um, this concept. Government overreach, I would yeah. say, is what uh, the overriding, more broad, broad theme that I explored. Uh, do you think that there's government overreach right now? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's what uh, we need to guard against, right. I think, at all costs, because uh, we go, we're, we're slowly going down that path, more mm -hmm. regulation, more uh, overreach of what was originally intended, not just by the founding documents, but by precedent leading up to today. Um, and if we're not aware of it and then don't take action to curb it, then um, we're passing on a country to future generations to our kids and grandkids that is uh, less free with less opportunity than, than we had. Interesting. So right now, as you, as you start to look at the current administration, and if we were to look into the future and say, what, what are the things that we have to look at and, and be prepared to, to, I guess, prepare ourselves for? What do you think is going to happen in the next presidential election, for instance? What yeah. do you think is going to happen in the midterm? 
Yeah, we'll, we'll midterm uh, and president. Well, let's hit, let's hit midterm and then let's hit. That's let's a hit tough one. So I'm watching just like everybody else, right. As far as that goes, and I really, I really don't know. Um, right. So I, uh, I have, I have some thoughts, but really, it's let's think strategically and then let's think tactically. So yeah. strategically, what do we, what do we need to do to get where we need to go to keep those freedoms for our children, and then how do we make those tactical level decisions that that help out getting that strategic um, uh, outcome. That, mm -hmm. we, that we want and for me it's about it's about family and right. what can I affect what can my circle affect so in the SEAL teams when I was a brand new guy it was just me and my radio right uh, then it became me my sniper rifle my radio and my secondary uh, communications guy then I became an officer and I had eight guys in my squad so my circle slowly started getting bigger and bigger with each uh, with each year in the military and each new new assignment uh, then I became a platoon commander and it got a little bigger and then I became a troop commander and then a, a, um, a task unit commander so it, it got bigger and bigger my my, my uh, circle of, of influence so right now it's back to me and my family right and then but also uh, through the medium of popular fiction through these novels um, I can weave things in I can weave in uh, some uh, elements that we're talking about today as far as this government overreach uh, things about the Second Amendment things about uh, hunting providing for your family and just weave those in to the political military thriller so I'm influencing somebody that grabs a is in the airport and wants to grab a spy novel off the shelf mm -hmm. and sees the terminal list and grabs it and heads to the plane or they're going on vacation or whatever and they get a thrilling ride but they also get a little bit of an education one right. of the things we've yeah. been talking about today so that's kind of how my i look at my sphere um growing and my sphere of influence um but even more tactically it's the family and it's raising those kids to uh, appreciate what they have appreciate the options and opportunities that uh, they've been given just by being born in mm -hmm. this amazing country um, and making them aware of it, talking about it and giving them examples of other places where and showing them, taking them to these other places where people aren't so lucky. Yeah. Just so they grow up with that appreciation um, and knowing that, hey, providing for your for your family, both financially um, and then also being there emotionally and uh, being able to defend your family. All those things just kind of make you who you are, make that family unit strong moving forward. But they're all based in, uh, in, in the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. So talking about them and making sure the kids are aware of them as we move forward, uh, I think, is that tactical level influence that we can all have. Well, and how are you? How are you doing that right now? So you know, you 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 talked about leadership with your with your own family, the things that you can impact. You know, what are you concentrated on when you're trying to make a, a positive impact with your family? Yeah, so it's getting out away from all these distractions, mm -hmm. all, right away from the iPhones, the iPads, um, all these activities that we have, which are all great for the kids and help them right. grow, uh, but it's a lot. Yeah. So getting out there, getting out there in the woods, getting out there in the backcountry with them, getting out hunting with them, teaching them responsibility, uh, how to handle a firearm, how to be safe with that firearm, um, how, to, uh, how to hunt and bring that meat back for the family. And then as we prepare that meat and those meals, uh, really give thanks and talk about where that came from right. and uh, thank the kid that, one, uh, that, that provided that for us. So it's just um, being out there together, teaching that self-reliance, um, and being able to to uh, to provide for the family. So you're talking really about uh, developing confidence through skill in some way, right? So developing different skills and encouraging. Yeah, more confidence. broadly, responsibility. Yeah, um, responsibility and self reliance. Yeah, and uh, and through that, an appreciation for being able to develop those things. Because in right. a lot of countries, you can't. Um, but we have the freedom to do that mm -hmm. here in this country. So uh, talking about it, not just thinking and mm -hmm. assuming that they're going to get it because of what we're doing, but really being able to articulate it um, and do it, talk about it, think back on it, and then revisit those experiences through preparing those meals mm -hmm. that uh, that we bring home from the field. So we, as a guy, you've accomplished a ton in your life compared to other men like that's that's like that's a fact right whether or not you agree with that or not it's it's just a fact we, you know fractions of a fraction of a fraction of a people go on to become navy seals and officers and then write a book and you like you you've done a lot um for guys that are out there like you know n normal every a average everyday guy or however we want to classify that you know how uh, how do they take some of the lessons learned and apply them on a daily? You know, what are you doing on a daily that 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 helps encourage and motivate you? You know, who are you listening to? What are you doing with your family? What are you thinking about? How do you how do you pass on some of those those pieces of wisdom? 
those nuggets. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, it's I never think about the odds. Mm-hmm. I never think about how hard something is because that's wasted bandwidth. Right. So I never thought about how hard it was to be a Navy SEAL other than, hey, I heard this is really hard. Mm-hmm. It must be good. That's what I want to do. I'm going to be in that 20% that makes it through. I never even thought about the 80% because right. um, I'm going to end up. And I, at the time coming in, I thought, you know, all there was was, you know, the, the Charlie Sheen type movie. Out Bad there. So ass. I thought, like, there's six dudes. Yeah. Yeah. On Had to team. get it on. You know? yeah. <laughs> I, I thought there were six guys. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be one of those six guys out of this 200 plus starting yeah. this class right here. <laughs> right. Like, it, so I never even thought about those odds. Right. Um, because I think that's wasted bandwidth. Same thing I get asked uh, by people about uh, the novel. Like, how did you mm-hmm. get to Simon and Schuster? How did you, do you know the odds of getting published by a large publishing house like Simon and Schuster as an unknown? And I say, no. I have, <laughs> I have no idea what those right. odds are because I never thought about it. I never right. wasted any time thinking about how hard it was or what are the you odds. Just were doing. I just wanted to do it because that yeah. bandwidth is wasted thinking about that, worrying about that. And so all mine was focused mm-hmm. on writing a book and making it the best book I possibly could. Uh, just like being the SEAL teams, it was focused on hey, getting through buds, getting to the team, being the best operator I possibly could, being the best leader I possibly could, uh, and then moving forward. So it wasn't about, oh, this is really hard or this is that. I, I never thought about any of that at all. So I would say for people that want to do something, no matter what it is, it doesn't have to be writing a book, it doesn't have to be uh, starting a company, it can be anything at all. Uh, but don't waste time thinking right. about how hard it is. Just know, okay, it's hard, check, boom, let's get mm-hmm. this done and drive forward because that's what life's all about is getting knocked down and getting up and moving forward every time. So um, I think that's the that's what I try to talk to the kids about and weave into those conversations that we have is that, um, you know, I think it came from Rocky, like Rocky, the strangest place, Rocky 4. And that, <laughs> and maybe people have used it. Uh, Rocky 5, yeah. is uh, People have six. watched Rockies all the way up to 5? Oh, my goodness. Really? It's so great. But it's a, I think he said, hey, life's not about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you get hit and mm-hmm. keep moving forward. So you just, hey, I'm gonna get hit at some point, I'm gonna go down, but I'm gonna get back up and keep moving. Right. And I'm not gonna worry about how hard it is. Like, just go and do it. That's why the Nike, just do it, still resonates yeah. today. It's so simple, and people yeah. still remember it today. Like, who remembers the Adidas one from the same time frame early No 80s? idea. Right, right, but you remember, just do it. Yeah. Because it is that simple. Get up and do it. Hmm. Is it though? Is it that, uh, and when I say that, it's, it's- Don't waste bandwidth thinking yeah. about the rest of it. No, I, I think you're right. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to get to that point. But where no, it's going to be hard. What are the things that just you're doing? Just don't obsess with doing? how hard it is. What are the things you're doing though? Because everything you do is hard. Like when I say that, it's everything in your life is, that you've done is hard. So how have you manufactured the internal motivation in order to accomplish what you've wanted to go out and achieve? Well, I wish I could tell you I was very disciplined about this approach and, uh, <laughs> and had it all written down. But uh, no, life is uh, is constant chaos and right. it is not what it appears to be on uh, on Instagram and, and all the what? rest of it. No way. <laughs> no. JT's life is exactly the way that he depicts it on Instagram. Right, which I think is dangerous because people look at that and they see, oh man, look at this. Everything's so perfect here. This is so right. awesome. This is so funny or this is so great. Look at these guys are doing. When for me anyway, behind the scenes, like there is chaos. We're juggling mm-hmm. three kids and uh, juggling not just the, the book, but I have these other businesses as well right. and uh so there's a lot a lot going on yeah. um but uh for me it is exactly that it is getting up and doing it trying to prioritize and i learned this from from jocko at some point along mm-hmm. the way when he was uh putting me through two of my two of my workups uh getting ready for deployment was hey prioritize and execute right so i try to keep that in mind every day because there's so many distractions today so many than there were so 10 many years ago more than 20 definitely more than 30 yes um but so prioritizing that time effectively so taking a minute to prioritize and then okay Got it. Here's my list of priorities, and now I execute instead of just execute, 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 execute. I'm mm-hmm. working my way down my list. Yeah. Uh, it's prioritizing and executing, and every so often, taking a breath, looking around, evaluating where you are, and then reprioritizing. Working hard. It's about working on the right things hard. Well, <laughs> at the right times. Yeah, being as effective and efficient as you possibly yeah. can with that time <clears throat> that you're given each day. And I've talked a lot about it, where it's a constant amount of time triage. It almost, for me, it happens every day. I have to I have to take a look at what I did the previous day, the previous week, the previous year, whatever that is, and then I chop away the 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 stuff that's just not going to work, and uh, and then bucket more yeah. energy into the things that are working, and you actually have to go do a bunch of shit to be honest with you in order to find out what what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. So that take what's takes useless, discipline. discard what's useless. Yeah. I think that was a. I think that was Bruce Lee. I won't take credit. You won't? No. You can. We're, well, I mean, no, that wouldn't you be right. You just say Navy SEAL shit, and then everybody's <laughs> like, yeah, I got it. But I think that's, uh, I think these are some really important pieces for definitely guys that are, are out there 
you know, guys and gals both are like trying to, to get motivation or they're trying to figure out what they're doing their next, their next phase of life. And these are important aspects of what has made you, you, which I think you've got, you can speak to, you know, yeah. what are you doing on a regular basis? Well, being able basis? to say, this is one, I'll give you one that I yeah. need to get better mm -hmm. at and that's it, saying no. Um, so being able to say no is something I need to work oh, on, yeah. develop, because it's not something that comes naturally. I mm -hmm. always want to help. I always yeah. want to say yes. Um, and it's very hard, especially at this stage where mm -hmm. I'm building something, I'm building a brand, I'm building a franchise, I'm writing, a, writing multiple books and uh, creating a, a business. So it's very right. entrepreneurial in, in its nature and in its spirit, um, which makes me want to take advantage of every option and opportunity out there so I can do exactly what you're saying, figure out what works. So I'm at that stage, which yeah. is uh, tough when you're juggling all the things that, that, uh, that we're all juggling, really. I but so being able to, to say no, um, yeah. and like we talked about last night, is figuring out what your par paradigm is, what your model is, what's important to you that allows you to stay say mm -hmm. no to something without putting too much thought into it, without wasting too much of that bandwidth on whether you should say yes or no. So mm -hmm. in the context of a transition from the military, uh, what I did was figure out what was important to me ahead of time because I knew there was going to be all these options and opportunities. Um, just and I feel very fortunate for that, of course, but I needed to figure out how to say no to some of them without spending days, weeks debating, researching, talking about each one of these things and then uh, figure out, no, this wasn't quite right. I don't think this is the right move uh, because that's wasted time. That's time that wasn't spent writing. That's time right. that wasn't spent building a new business. That yeah. was time that wasn't spent on something productive. So figuring out what's important. And for me, that was freedom. That was the overarching umbrella. Mm -hmm. Things had to fit that. It had to fit financially and then had to fit with my schedule. I had to be able to control my time and uh, spend time with my family because the next stage in life is about them. Mm -hmm. The first one was about the country, about the team, about the mission. The second part of life here is really about taking care of my family and being there for them because they put up with a, a lot over the past right. 20 years. Um, so figuring out what's important to you first so you know the answers to these questions mm -hmm. um, before they even get asked, essentially. So figure out what's important to you, whatever that is. And for me, it's freedom. And everybody will have something that's different. And I couldn't agree more, which is interesting because we both ha share that 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 same drive to uh, to a certain degree, which is that was my number one priority. I know I did not want to be managed by somebody else ever again in yep. my life. Didn't want to be. I didn't want to work for somebody. I didn't want to be managed by anybody. Exactly. I wanted freedom. Now, sink or swim, I own that shit, and that's the beauty of it, which is success or failure. But if you define success. And there are two routes for me in, in this, this adventure, which is I will not work for another person as long as I live, which is freedom. But through that, you've got, you've got a bifurcation in the road, which is you have to go and ultimately be prepared to be uh, in poverty <laughs> if you do, because sink or swim individually, you own it. Uh, or you can create enough wealth and independence that you can own your own life in a way that directly benefits and enhances your life so you you can you can achieve the same freedom through both wealth and poverty you can actually yeah no, because I, if absolutely. you chop away the material aspects of life and get to the core premise which is freedom and family you still own it it's still yours your time is yours yeah and i've got a few friends out there that have been able to do that where they've said no and they basically live super simply living in a van down by the river but they're fucking incredible free. man like they're free yeah. and i think that a lot of people where their unhappiness comes from is they're trapped yeah they're they've built a prison of their own their own construction and they put themselves in it and now they're trying to figure out a way out. Well, it's easy to fall into that. Yeah. There's no, no doubt about it. There's easy to fall into that trap. It's easy to overcommit. Mm -hmm. um, and then living in a van down by the river, there is freedom there. But once you add family to that, once you add some other, you know, maybe some family members that have special needs or whatever yeah. else it is, uh, now you have a responsibility right. to them. That's more than just you being free or feeling free. Well, it could and be a today, sprinter van. That's a good point. On the beach. Ooh, yeah, like that's pretty so epic. Yeah. That's yeah, a fucking I saw a really good nice one solar. this last week. Right. Yeah, solar. solar. Like I got my surfboards. I got my family. <laughs> to that. We're going on long runs in the Cascades. It's fucking epic, man. That's a good, for, that's a great, good daydream. Great for Instagram. Yeah. 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 It's great a great content. Instagram, but in all reality, that shit is super tight. There's hardly any room for any fucking food. 
You know, you can't sleep because your kids are kicking you in the fucking face right. all night. Yeah, the sense of what is what makes you free mm-hmm. has definitely morphed over time. So, uh, you know, now you can't just head west because you'd walk into the Pacific Ocean. God, or back, you yeah. used to be able to head west yeah. and stake a claim and have some land and all the rest of it. And there was freedom in that. Uh, today, would you have been not. one of those guys, do you think? I would think so. Yeah. I would, uh, I would you would have so. been a pioneer. I would be out of the yeah. city, out of that, <laughs> especially back then. And uh, and heading west to freedom. Absolutely. Do you think you would have been like a mountain man or something like that? Do I you would think hope so. I have the beard now. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you look like you got one. it. So I think <laughs> swing an axe. Yeah. Uh, Do you think you could have been like a Jeremiah Johnson type character? Do you I think that so. could have been? I think that would have been my calling. Really? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I was like, that's freedom then. Today, you know, not so much. Today, it's really that freedom is financial. Right. Which that that isn't as much as we hate to talk about as much as it mm-hmm. as some people might not like to acknowledge that. Um, that is a a large piece of it today that can give you Absolutely. that same freedom that you yeah. used to have heading west for that financial, as long as you don't fall into those traps that yes. we just talked about, uh, it can give you that same sense of freedom in today's world. So figuring out what that is, what that is for you, what freedom is, is for you, and everyone's mm-hmm. might look a little different as far as that level of prosperity uh, and level of different opportunities for your for your kids and, and grandkids. Uh, it's going to be a little different. So figuring out what that yeah. is, not falling into those traps along the way, and then getting after it yeah and freedom could be the the individual aspects where you choose to join a company and move through the corporate ranks and infrastructure in order to become an executive because you own your life that's the choice that you've made and and it could be i've i've decided that you know i'm not i'm not going to have a profession i'm going to you know read books and fucking live in a teepee on the beach okay but at least you own it and you're not controlled by somebody else that ultimately yep. decides whether or not you work that day or you don't work or whom whatever that is oh, yeah. now granted we all have priorities and we have responsibilities but i think that's a super important thing which is people have to define what success looks like to them what is freedom what is success and the more they chop out all the white noise the shit that kind of just pollutes their mind every day and they say what is it exactly that makes me me that can get me out of fucking bed in the morning and kick me in the ass and drive me towards one single point focused objective what is that but you're not going to find it on Instagram. That ain't going to fucking happen. No, no. We talk great marketing platform, but yeah. uh, but that's about it. Um, and it can inspire. As yeah, well. for we sure. talked about Absolutely. difference between being motivated and it being ins- and having inspiration. So two different things. Yes. Uh, I'd, and I would say forget about the motivation and you know look for inspiration in people and mm-hmm. examples and people that uh, that you can emulate or get something from, get a nugget of information from that make you a better person and help you along your journey. So definitely a difference between inspiration and motivation. And then also along the way, you can't lose sight of those other things that are important because you can pick your head up 20 years from now after building uh, a company or whatever right. else thinking that you're going for this freedom and then you look up kids are gone uh you don't know your wife anymore um and you have another whole host of issues and you actually created a problem set that you were trying to avoid when you started the journey um but for me i figure i worked for somebody for 20 years worked for the u.s government and it uh moving forward i was not gonna do that anymore right it's uh it's time to do it uh (laughs) do it myself who's Who's inspiring and motivating you now outside of your family, of course? Oh, geez, well, I'm, I'm so fortunate to have had uh, some great mentors yeah. along the way. And I think that's the most important thing as well for people. People ask me, what, what, uh, what foundation should I give to you that helps help military veterans and all that sort of thing? And I say the most impactful thing that you can do is mentor somebody along or at least be one of the people that offers that opportunity to them through an internship and slash mentorship for with your company for a couple weeks, a month to find out if it's the right fit. Because usually the people coming out, all they know about these different professions are what they saw on TV or what they heard in a snippet of a conversation somewhere or in a movie, whether it's law, whether it's finance, uh, medicine, yeah. uh, starting their own company, getting the tactical space, whatever it may be, but they don't really know what it's like and they fully commit to something to find out it's not the right thing right. for them. And then they have to do it again yeah. and mm-hmm. again. Whereas if they did a mentorship slash internship program with a few in a few different spaces, they could find that right fit. Uh, if they weren't going to start their own, or maybe they can do learn along the way how to do it, learn some best practices, learn what works, what doesn't, uh, and then branch off on their own. So um, really 
if you want to make an impact on somebody transitioning from the military, it's that mentorship slash internship type program where you give them a glimpse into your world to find out if it's a good fit or not. So who's who's uh, inspiring and motivating you? Yeah, well, you know, Jocko is doing yeah. amazing. All right, yeah. there you go. Job. Drink a bro of the week. Yeah. Jocko. He's Jocko. An incredible <laughs> post-military. He did a great job in the military. Had a huge influence on training, particularly on the West Coast. Well, I think um, it's good. Here, Jack, why don't you just give... so. Every episode, we, uh, we, we, we give somebody the drinking bro of the week, and we define what they meant to the individual. So define, uh, let's give it to Jocko and define do what it. Jocko's done for you. Yeah, so personally, he taught me a lot. Of, it's just what we talked about before, prioritize and execute. And mm-hmm. I was lucky to be able to learn it in a training environment. So you're at a Mount facility, Fort Knox, and they throw a training cell, throws a whole bunch of stuff at you, and they just keep ramping it up, ramping it up, so you can learn from your mistakes, essentially. So helicopter crash down, mission, down men, all sorts of chaos going on. And as a brand new, uh, not a brand new officer, but a new officer as a platoon commander, um, now I'm in charge of all these different elements. I'm not just one element that's going out to take care of my tactical responsibility. Now I have multiple maneuvering elements on the battlefield. Um, And luckily in a training environment, one of the best, um, uh, like most important uh, and most impactful lessons I learned from Jocko was I try to take on too much. So we had they had a hell of fake helicopter down in there. We had guys on the radio that are wounded. They're under fire from that helicopter. You have guys in a building. You've taken wounded, and you're trying. I'm trying to deal with all of it because I want to be successful. Right? Mm-hmm. I want to be. I want to impress the guys. I want to want to make the right decisions. Um, but really, what I should have done: take a breath, prioritize, execute, deal with a firefighter at hand, take care of our wounded, reconsolidate, figure out if we can then allocate assets to go to that helicopter crash site instead of doing it all. At right. one. So very tactical <laughs> level, but it was very impactful, as you can tell. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was great to be able to do that in a training environment. But it's all because of what Jocko did and how he um, structured that training to get that end result that he wanted. And uh, so I, I will forever be grateful for him for not just that, but everything that he passed on, all those lessons learned that he really learned in Ramadi in 2006 right. uh, and then wanted to pass on to future generations of frogmen. So uh, he took that upon himself to do that and really restructure the entire training program for the West Coast. So his impact on the SEAL teams, uh, particularly on the West Coast SEAL teams, um, you can't overstate what he did there. And then post-Navy, his sphere of influence yeah. has grown it's, it's exponentially. huge exponentially. Uh, so he's in- inspiring, not, not motivating, as you know from talking to him, yeah. uh, how big he is on the, the discipline equaling freedom, yep. um, but really inspiring people to see what's possible and to go after whatever it is that they that they want, whatever their dream is. Um, he's, he's having a huge impact, really across industry. So, huge um, impact. Yeah, drinking bro of the week. So Hell drinking yeah. bro of the week, Jocko, even though I don't Cheers. think he drinks, right? Cheers. So. I mean, Cheers. He, now. he has ice cream. Right. He, he drinks, he drinks pomegranate cream. tea. How does, uh, how does everybody <laughs> so, find you yeah. All right. on the internet? Show all right. us. Yeah, tell us where they can find you. All right. And do the texting right. All right, let's do the texting right. So you can text 44222 and write Jack Carr, J-A-C-K-C-A-R-R, and you will get an email or a text right. back from me where you can put your your email address mm-hmm. in there and be added to the uh, added to the team where you'll get uh, uh, sneak peeks into what's coming maybe cool. some movie news maybe a new book cover all right uh, and then first look at some of the things that go up on the blog which are deep dives into different weapons used in the mm-hmm. books so sniper weapon systems m4 knives um, some of the things about the publishing industry just about my journey in general right so um, you can do that four four two 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 it's right. what you text and write Jack, Jack Carr. Carr, C-A-R-R. Awesome. In and there. Instagram, Jack Carr, Instagram, right? Jack, Jack Carr. Carr. Nope, Jack Carr, USA. Oh, shit. Okay. Uh, Jack Carr, so on USA. those three, uh, three, in, three social media platforms, right. Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, it's Jack Carr, USA. And I get back to people on Twitter and Instagram. That's where I really awesome. uh, hey, talk it just, to people. Just so everybody knows, we, we don't take paid sponsorships uh, like this. We, we This is not a paid sponsorship or endorsement. This is just our buddy, uh, and we, we believe in the book. We believe in what he's done. Uh, we, we think it's an incredible and fascinating story, but more importantly, what he's doing is he's showing that veteran transition, uh, veteran success is possible, and you can do whatever it is that you set your mind to as long as you prioritize and execute that's it that's it thank you Beautifully very done. much jack thank we you will absolutely be indebted for you coming <laughs> into the stuff into the oh, uh, thank you guys so much show. for having me it's been a blast and great catching up hey, we'll talk, uh, yeah yeah we'll talk offline about some more <laughs> miserable stories <laughs> i don't want to go to jail all right Not today. goodbye Bye.